Of course. Mr. Chairman, I just I want to take this because I'm going to have another hearing at the same time and may not be able to stay for yes, all of this. So I do want to say when you're talking about the magnitude of the problem, you know, in Massachusetts, 52 percent of those who are HIV positive are 50 or older, and 15 <clears throat> percent are 60 or older. This is an issue that now is profoundly affecting an aging population, and I want to commend you and the ranking member for having a hearing on this. But I want to add on this, there really are moments of hope in this battle. We've made tremendous progress in treating HIV and are making exciting headway toward a cure. Just a few months ago, researchers in Boston presented exciting clinical results that two patients had undetectable HIV after bone marrow transplants. Um, and Fenway Health has been engaged in important population studies, clinical research studies with the LGBT community since the very beginning of the HIV epidemic. And they have really helped bring forward our research and our understanding of this issue. I just want to make the point that progress is made possible by smart investments in basic research and population research by the government, by private industry, and by nonprofit groups. And as our population living with HIV and at risk for HIV ages, we need to make sure that we are gathering and coordinating data on the long-term effects of HIV drugs, on HIV drug interactions with medications used by an older population, and on how best to treat older HIV patients who are developing common comorbidity problems. So I just want to thank you for having this hearing, for getting us this focus, and I hope we will talk more about the importance of continuing research in this area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you're already over 50 percent Yes, today. we are. Yes, we are. Over 50 percent of your HIV population is 50, age 50 or over. That's right. This is an urgent problem. In Massachusetts, it's a coming problem for all the rest of the country. And that's why it is so important that we continue research in this area, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to the screening question. I know that we started down the line on it, but there's something else I'd like to press about screenings. And that is when I look at the information we have, that the risk of HIV is rising for the older population, that a larger proportion of, of older Americans that, that our risk profile is changing that those who are 50 and older have the lowest use of condom, uh, rate of use of condoms. Those who are 50 and older have the lowest rates of screening for HIV. And that for those who are 50 and older, uh, it's harder to screen because of comorbidities, uh, uh, symptom identification. So it's more difficult uh, sometimes to catch it simply by symptoms or other factors. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start the question by asking you, Mr. Teets, could you just identify and, and really push on the point for us about the importance of screening and how screening older Americans for HIV would make a difference? Yes, uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I think as Dr. Valtasari also noted earlier, um, uh, the current recommendation, of course, from the uh, U.S. Public um, Preventive Services Task Force um, uh, is up to 65 um, and CDC up to 64 for routine screening. Um, lots of views on what routine means here, but the, the point would be that we should encourage providers and, and um, patients alike to think about HIV screening as getting your blood pressure done, as getting your cholesterol checked. It just becomes routinized. It becomes normal that this is the thing we do. And it's, so there's a big need for education here, both public and, and private provider. We think that the, um, the CDC, I think, thinks that the bulk of the, the above 50 uh, new diagnoses and new infections and greatest risk is really in the 50 to 65. So it's, yes, I, wouldn't, I, I personally would like to see um, the, the recommendation go higher, and I think there's some good economic data. The CDC has to consider the cost um, of everything they recommend. So, what, so in considering the cost, there's some good data that suggests that uh, uh, HIV testing um, is cost effective uh, up to the low 70s. Um, so I, yes, I'd like to see it go higher, but frankly, we're not doing very well with the 50 to 65, so maybe we could just start with that. But, but Mr. Teets, if I can, just because I want to be sure we get it on the record, 
just identify for us, if we do the screening, you can't do cost without talking about yeah. the benefit. If we do the screening, what are the benefits oh. of of the detection. Sure. That's the part I'd like to hear. Oh, well, y you'll find folks who are uh, younger, closer to the, to the point at which they got infected. Uh, we all know that treatment outcomes are much, much better the sooner you find folks. The, the, the closer you get to treating them um, after their infection, the more likely they're going to have a good outcome. Um, we, as Dr. Valdeseri noted earlier, uh, and I think Dr. Johnson as well, uh, older folks have, uh, you know, just in general, uh, uh, an immune system, if, for lack of a better way of putting it, is wearing out. So, uh, and it just doesn't respond as well. So you'll see that even though older adults um, tend to be better about taking their meds, particularly above 65s, the response isn't quite as good for that reason. So the sooner the better. I think that the truth is with HIV, the sooner the, sooner the better with all. Okay, so we get better outcomes. Anything you want to add to that? Well, Perhaps about then, transmission? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say that if he didn't. All right. <laughs> right, right. I, I think yeah. it was known as leading right. the witness, Mr. Chairman. Right, uh -huh. yes. Um, very good Very good at leading the witness. Um, so, yeah, so, so the study that, that Dr. Valdesari noted earlier, uh, HPTN052, I think, 96% um, uh, reduction um, uh, in terms of uh, risk of transmission for someone who has an undetectable viral load. So, so the, the better we do at this cascade, at this, at this nice picture that Dr. Valdesari gave us, the better we do on this end, on the low end here, the, the greater likelihood we get to the end of AIDS by, by uh, preventing those, that many more new cases. Okay, good. So, and may, I, may I add one thing, Senator, that we know from a variety of research studies, this isn't just specific to older Americans, but the vast majority of people when they find out they're infected with HIV are very motivated to not transmit that infection to partners. That, that's aside from the treatment issue, which is, a tr is tremendous in itself. Right. But that information is empowering, and most people want to take and will take steps to interrupt transmission. OK, so better treatment outcomes and lower rates of transmission, substantially lower rates of transmission. So Dr. Valdeseri, what are you doing to increase screening among older Americans? Well, as, as I had mentioned when you were out of the room, we, we actually think the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommendation ruling was a tremendous advance forward uh, because in conversations, frankly, in conversations with large payers and large insurance systems, um, there was some concern sometimes among medical directors about, well, the CDC says we should be doing routine screening, but the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force doesn't recommend it. So I would start by saying that, that now that just happened in this spring, mm -hmm. in April. So that was a tremendous step forward. Um, I can also tell you, wearing another hat, still government but not HHS, I spent four years at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And one of the uh, major efforts that, that we undertook, I was part of the team that led that, is that we got the legislation changed across the entire VA system, which uh, required scripted pretest counseling and signature consent before any veteran could be tested for HIV. And what that translated into, because healthcare providers are busy, the HIV testing rate was like 10% across the entire VA system. Now, certainly we still want informed consent. We don't want people tested without their knowledge, but we were able to change the federal law, change the reg, change policies in healthcare settings to verbal consent documented in the chart, some basic information, and that rate has shot up and is continuing to go up. So what we need to do is get also, as Daniel said, we need to have providers and clients alike start thinking about the HIV test like they think about cholesterol screening and not as some kind of special test that just these high-risk people from who know where uh, have to take it, that everyone needs to take the test. Good. So let me just push on that just a little bit. I understand the point about trying to get people to change how they think about it. What I want to know is does HHS have any programs in the work as you did at uh, VA to try to uh, move oh, absolutely. forward so we get better screening? Absolutely. I, I, mean, I give you a chance to show. Show, absolutely. CDC has a number of major 
uh, public information and awareness campaigns uh, that are targeted to uh, various populations about the importance of, of early diagnosis, also trying to destigmatize testing because as we heard from Ms. Massey, that's still an issue. Mm -hmm. So many people are still fearful about learning their status. So we have those kinds of, of efforts underway. Um, and I think also a lot of work with professional organizations. We also want to try to influence the care providers to develop more of a culture of prevention in primary care settings. And then finally, I would say the other really important uh, avenue and opportunity to increase HIV testing is through the community health centers. Uh, we're talking about, as you know, a national system serving uh, uh, in individuals, many of whom are uh, at high risk for or living with HIV and undiagnosed. And so efforts to get HIV testing into community health centers where we currently don't have testing are a very active uh, part of what HHS is doing to try to promote uh, awareness. Now, I do want to say that that's just the first part of the cascade. So once the testing takes place, we need to make sure we have systems in place to link people actively in care and to meet their needs so that, you know, if they're depressed, if they have uh, unstable housing, if, if they can't eat, all of these things are going to impact their ability to stay in care. So we have to work all the way down the cascade, but you're right. It begins with diagnosis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your generosity on the time. Uh, 